Hey friends, nice to see you. Uh, I'm here with Bambi and we are going to answer some of your questions. So, say hello. Hello. Ah. Alrighty, I just saw a number of you at our huddle, so thank you so much. It was great to see you and I hope your strat quiz went well. First of all, chapter 14, my overall thoughts, fantastic questions. My marker and I are still working through your CPA way wrap ups. So the actual marking of them, but I went through the videos and I gathered these questions here. I gathered all your questions, but I just want to say that a theme that I saw going through all of these where my overall thoughts are a number of you, so many of you are asking why, you know, why is it like this? And not just you know, like, why is the sky blue? But like, you know, really asking questions that build on them. So I just want to say that I acknowledge the why. I acknowledge tying it in to other materials in the chapter, um, just a constant theme. So I want to say, first off, kudos. And it's been a pleasure to watch all of <laughs> your videos. And I want to say a special shout out to, uh, I think you know who you are. Got the, the, from somebody. So I know when you do it twice, it doesn't mean as much, but I had fun watching it. So thank you. Okay. So, uh, first question, it, lots of dividend questions. So again, I tried to group these by types. How does a company determine how much dividends? So if you think about this, a company, you know, they have their revenues, they have their expenses, uh, they pay their taxes and they're left with profit. And that profit is retained in the company. But with that profit, and yes, being mindful, of course, of cash flow, um, they can either choose to retain that profit, which then gets, you know, put through retained earnings, or they can uh, reinvest it. So, you know, goes into retained earnings and then it'll be reinvested. Um, or they can issue dividends. You know, we can get tricky. There's some other things that can be done, but like in general, um, they can either keep it or they can, <laughs> uh, they can give it to shareholders. And one of the ways that they can give it to shareholders is through dividends. So shareholders like this because it's like, Hey, cool. You buy this company or you invest in the preferred shares. And then, you know, you give a big chunk and you're looking for that long-term growth, but you know, <laughs> she's just going to go crazy in her little blanket. Okay. And then she'll settle in. Um, but then it'd be nice if you can get like those, you know, little bits of profit along the way so that you're not just waiting for the one big payout at the end. Some companies have a history of providing a dividend, you know, giving those little treats to investors while others you know, are very flat out and say, no, like we do not have a history of giving dividends. We do, we choose not to, um, we're in it for the long run. And a company that comes to mind that doesn't pay dividends would be Apple. Um, so how much dividends really just depends, depends on the company. It depends what they're after. It depends if they have a good year. It depends if they have a, a history. Um, and so really good question. Um, what types of dividends? Okay. So typically, it's either going to be cash dividends or stock dividends. And why would a company issue property dividends? Well, a company may issue property dividends and you can think about this like land, like actual property. Uh, you can think about it like shares that a company owns in another company. So think about that for a moment, but then place it on a shelf and know that we'll come back to that in advanced accounting too. So it gets a little bit conceptually tricky. That's property just like anything else. Um, so maybe it's because they don't have cash to give and they don't want to dilute um, the shares. They don't want to kind of do more of a um, kind of a symbolic issuance of additional shares for dividends. Uh, but they want to give the investors something to say, hey, like, thanks so much. Perhaps there's some redundant assets. Um, perhaps they don't want to have to go through the pain in the butt of selling them. Or what I've typically seen more so is in private companies when it's owner owner operated, it might be part of like a strategic item as far as their tax um, planning goes. So that's why they would issue a property dividend. 
Um, why does declaring a stock dividend not impact shareholders' equity? Okay, so let's take a little look-see at this. I go back to my debits and credits people. So if we are doing any sort of dividend, we are going to debit retained earnings. And if this is a stock dividend, we are going to be debit crediting common shares. So these two buckets are both in shareholders' equity. So we literally just like moved it around in shareholders' equity. And we said, okay, we're going to reduce the stuff that's held in the company and reflect it in the fact that um, essentially we took the profits and then forced our current investors to buy more, to like double down on their items. Okay, so I had somebody ask um, why, why, um, kind of what does the date of declaration mean? Um, so the date of declaration is the date in which we declare that these dividends are, you know, that's, we're like, hey, guys, like we got some dividends, but it doesn't always coincide in when we're able to pay out. So when we declare it, that's when we book it because that's like the inciting or the exciting incident. And then we have our date of record. That's all the shareholders as at this date that we're going to pay out. And then we actually have uh, the dividend payout date. So um, the dividend uh, video, I'll link it down below. Uh, that's a good one. Um, a lot of these questions were built off of that um, video. So I'll link just so that it's handy. Uh, and then a few of the questions that I received, a-okay. But um, I think that if you watch the video again, um, it, it start will help um, the concepts in there kind of solidify. So the questions help the material settle in. Okay. Stock dividend. Uh, the person was saying can, it can be good, it can be bad, um, but they wanted me to talk a bit more about the stock dividend. So, and what, how I would assess if a stock dividend was good or bad based on what I discussed in the video. And I just said that it depends how the market will receive it. Um, so the student was asking me, how do I determine if it is good or if it's bad? Um, so I would take a look at the press release. I would take a look at what the market is signaling as far as what the stock price does. You know, typically if the stock price goes up, people are liking it. Uh, if it goes down, people aren't liking it, you know, in general. Um, you know, all other things being equal. I'd also see if there was any analyst reports on it, if the company is of a decent size. What are people saying? Um, what is the buzz in the streets? So how does stock price pay in? Okay, so accounting. We put things on our books pretty much at book value. Very rarely uh, do we get to revalue them, you know, up or down. And uh, so unless there's like an inciting incident, like a beginning of something else, or an impairment where we need to, you know, we cut it off at a certain ceiling. Most of our stuff, you know, like we, we like our book value. We like our historical cost. So stock price. If you as a company have tremendous faith, uh, insights, uh, you know, belief that your company is worth more than the market is valuing it. So the market would value it as a uh, number of common shares outstanding times by the share price. That would be like the market value of your company, one of the values. Um, and then you would look at, you know, your value. Um, perhaps you look at your book value. Um, you might also look at kind of your book value, you know, what's our assets minus our liabilities, but then look at, you know, what makes your company, what are those assets invested in? Where are your long-term plays? Where are your short-term wins? Um, perhaps you just acquired a company and maybe the market isn't seeing what you're seeing. They're not seeing the synergies. So that share price didn't go up enough to like reflect that. If you're sitting around with a bunch of extra cash, you may choose as a company to go out to the market and spend, take that cash, basically give it back to the people who bought your shares to begin with at a price and you might feel like that's a really good deal. So you would credit cash, debit common shares, reduce the amount of um, common shares outstanding, and then that does two things. 
First of all, supply and demand, you know, econ 101, if there's fewer shares out there, yeah, that's right, uh, the price goes up, but also, gosh, like what a power move. If you're like, mm, we got some extra cash, and instead of investing it in, you know, some extra training or buying another um, piece of equipment, we're saying like, no, 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 our company is so valuable that we're gonna go buy our shares back because um, we know that it's gonna be worth way more in the future. So sometimes it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I gotta say, I'm a big fan of power moves, uh, sometimes as overt as that, um, but sometimes uh, power moves can be more subtle. Uh, I have a little bit of a series that I wrote on power moves as it relates to CPA candidates. Uh, and they're, they're quite short little series. Um, I'll link it down below. So I'll make a quick note of that. And yeah, I'm happy if you read it, send me an email, make a comment, let me know what your thoughts are. Uh, good, bad, otherwise, happy to hear uh, from you. Okay. How long does it take to make a company go from public to private? Oh. Um, so essentially, somebody would have to go out and buy up <laughs> all of the, uh, the common shares outstanding or they would just have to go out, buy in enough of the common shares that's standing uh, and enough of the board seats, get power, and then, oh, and then, and then go through that. So if I'm thinking about a recent example, uh, it would be WestJet. So WestJet, I can't remember when it closed, but I feel like from announcement to when it was bought, so WestJet was public and trading on uh, the TSX, I believe, um, they may have been trading on the Nasdaq as well, but they were definitely trading on the TSX. And then um, they got bought up. It was an all cash deal. So somebody literally was like, I will buy all the shares. Uh, the board voted and accepted that. And within, I want to say about a year. Um, so is that the average time? Is that a long time? Is it a short time? I don't know. I feel like it's a time time. How common is it to issue stocks for non-cash? Uh, as I said above, not super duper common um, for property dividends, even, um, sorry, super not common for uh, stock dividends, even less common for property dividends, more so in private companies uh, when it's part of a tax planning strategy. Okay. Dividend payout. Preferred. So this is, somebody wanted me to go through kind of the dividend payout order of operations. So it would be looking at our prep shares in arrears. Somebody asked, and maybe we'll see that coming up, maybe I'm just jumping the gun a little bit, um, when, if we had preferred shares that weren't cumulative, would we ever have dividends in arrears? No. If they're not cumulative, too bad, so sad. If nothing was declared that year, it is gone. You can't go backwards. Um, it's just, it is what it is. Okay. So we have our dividend, we have our preferred shares and arrears, then we have our preferred shares, and then um, we, we got to read the details. So as you would see in our chapter, our first connect practice problem, so specifically the third question for chapter 14, we would have seen uh, some detail in there. So saying, okay, um, after the preferred share, we have a matching for common share, and then the preferred share are fully participatory, or and then the preferred share are participatory up to 90 cents or up to a dollar per preferred share. So really, it, I know it sounds tricky, but these are legal contracts. Like you gotta think about this. These are people investing in the company and they are investing um, through contracts made by bankers and lawyers and accountants and finance guys and girls and peoples, and they are complicated because they're legal contracts. So we need to be able to read and absorb and understand the basic operations and then just really get in and read there. Um, those of you in audit, you will know that uh, doing a completeness check of liabilities and reading the contracts and reading all the clauses in the contracts um, comes in handy. Uh, especially to get comfort over that completeness of liabilities typically. So arrears, if applicable, pref share dividends for current year, uh, any 
matching uh, for our common share and then um, proportional or proportional up to kind of a cap. So reading, um, you know, reading the question. Okay. So stock splits impact the common share price. So internally, all a stock split does is it's a memo, it's a memo entry. So if we have 2 million shares outstanding, we have a stock split two for one, then we'd have 4 million outstanding. And then um, external to the company, same thing. If you had, you know, one share and it was split two for one, you now have two shares. Um, so that's how it happens. But why would they do that? So if we take a peek, uh, Tesla just recently did this and I will link the Tesla one down below as well. So Tesla and who else um, was in here? I believe Apple. So what they did is they made it, they made it much cheaper. So they did a five to one split. Uh, so they said, cool, if you have a million shares outstanding, you now have five million. So in theory, if you had one share worth one dollar and it was now now for that one share you had five shares, the value at that exact moment stays the same. So you still have one dollar, except you now have one dollar over five shares, so 20 cents each. But now it makes it much more accessible. Because, you know, if you think about it, if you're looking at $498 per share, that's really expensive. It's really expensive to buy one, um, you know, even though we're accountants and we're like, yeah, but like it's still $10,000 worth of a company is $10,000 worth of a company. Um, it's, it's just less accessible when it's more expensive. So yeah, they split it up. More people want to buy it if there's higher demand and the same amount of um, items available. If there's higher demand, then that will drive the stock price up. So even said here, um, it makes it more affordable for investors. Um, like, I really like this. I'm gonna, yeah, again, uh, this is a great article for kind of putting it in plain language and then kind of showing and telling you as well the same thing that happened with Apple. Cool. All righty. So now I want to go on to the CPA way, uh, the CPA way question on the side, the highlighted ones are the ones that people requested that I answer. So let's look at number seven first. The question here says recorded an increase in the fair value of a fair value OCI investment in shares that will then be distributed as a property dividend. And then they said the fair value, um, the carrying amount of the fair value OCI investments was greater than its cost. So here we know that there was an increase in the fair value that will be distributed. So in order to recruit, basically what we need to do is we need to debit the investment, which this is asset on the um, balance sheet. This is the fair value OCI shares. And then we would need to credit the OCI account. So that's what this is asking us to do right here. What is, you know, what is this initial entry for these shares that will be distributed in the future? So I think um, and a few people of me got tricked, tricked up with the wording a little bit. So this is an asset account. This is an equity account. When we credit an equity account, that increases the equity account. And that is why seven here is an I for increase. Okay, so now going on to number nine, they distributed the investment to uh, shareholders. So keep in mind, we're kind of working through. So eight was when we declared the property dividend and when we declare a property dividend, that's when we actually, so maybe I'll just go through it. So now we declared the property dividend, we would uh, debit uh, retained earnings and we would uh, credit, oh goodness, um, either the, like, well, we declared it, so I guess we would just say uh, declared dividends payable, uh, maybe we'll just say um, investment shares, you know, we'll just basically say it, but we haven't quite gotten rid of it, so that's why this debit here would decrease shareholders' equity, and that's why number eight here says decrease, and then on the date of um, number nine, so when we actually distribute the 
um, the investment, we would then um, credit this dividends payable for the investment shares that we set up. Pardon me. Did I say? We would or reverse it out. And then we would credit the actual, I'm just going to get lazy. We would credit this person up here. Uh, and you can see right here, this is um, debiting a liability and this is crediting an asset and has no impact on shareholders equity here for number nine. And then when we declared a stock dividend, uh, same thing. Um, well, same, same, but different. So number 10, we would um, declare it. So we would have to book it. So perhaps we um, debit um, retained earnings. I really wish it would say <laughs> um, declared and paid, but no, it just says declared. So that is why um, we would um, debit this and credit our um, common shares. And so you can see that, oops. First day using Excel, apparently. Alrighty. Uh, so now distributing a stock dividend. So I really just want to point out here the reason why we're like, hey, this is like declared. This is recorded. Um, that's like the inciting or the exciting event. That's what makes stuff happen. Whereas, you know, when things are actually distributed, that's like a non-event from an accounting perspective. That's like people pushing around paper and like executing on the thing. Whereas accountants, we need to reflect the economic reality. That happens when something is declared. So that is the inciting event. Okay, um, so 13, converted preferred shares into common shares. And oh, this is an interesting one because it really depends. This one should have been increase, decrease, and it should have been no effect, and here's why. You're going to see in the next chapter, you're going to see complex financial instruments where we really need to investigate these prep shares. Are they acting more like debt or are they acting more like equity? This answer uh, took a little bit of an assumption, didn't state their assumption. So yours would have been marked right either way had this been an exam. Um, but, um, and if you put no effect and you, you know why, perhaps you stated why, I'm happy either way because it is a little bit of a controversial item. I'm really actually happy that this came up during questions um, because yeah, um, prep shares might be equity as we've seen. They absolutely could be there. Um, or for accounting purposes, uh, they might be acting more like debt and then should be whoop, whoop, up there. Great questions. All right, let's go back. So last one, contributed capital. Um, why would somebody donate their shares? So that's a really good question. Um, somebody might donate their shares so that they don't have to pay tax on them. So if I own shares in a company and I, um, and I sell them, then I have to pay taxes on the capital gains for whatever the proceeds are minus the adjusted cost base. And then in Canada, I pay capital gains on 50% of that capital gain, right? Taxable capital gains are going to be 50% of that. Um, so if you really want to dig into the nitty gritty, Laura can uh, talk to you guys about that. I uh, love tax. I uh, have some tax stuff set up myself, but oh goodness. Uh, that was a little bit of a reward to myself is the moment um, I started working here and getting really, really nitty gritty with financial reporting. Um, you know, tax got to take a bit of a back backseat. Some people love tax. Um, some people uh, are like hobbyists and I'd say I'm more of a hobbyist with tax. Okay. And then some other people said, well, why would I, why would a company donate property into a corporation or donate? Um, and one of the reasons might be that um, they wanted to get in the company, uh, but they, again, for tax reasons, uh, tax reasons beyond the scope of this course. And for, yeah, let's just keep it beyond the scope of this course and likely um, your undergrad. Um, but we do see this question come up in CPA. So how do you account for, you know, donated property? Well, what happens if, a, if somebody donates some 
property uh, to a company, you would debit the asset, debit the property, and then you would credit the contributed surplus because as we saw in, huh, in a review class last night, as well as I think it was a review class. Um, so feel free to check out Brightspace content review class for TT number one. Um, we saw their shareholders equity has, you know, a pile of money. This is stuff that was internally generated by the company. Your retained earnings, your OCI if you are IFRS, or this is, you know, other people's money. People that other people put into the company, uh, either in common shares or in our contributed surplus. Okay, so just wrapping this up a little bit with our public versus private um, and IFRS versus ASPE. So I want to be very, very clear. If you are a public company in Canada, yes, you have to report under IFRS. Um, but there are instances in which, you know, quote unquote private companies may also legally have to report under IFRS. And that tends to be if they are you know, widely held, so have a, a bunch of shareholders, um, or if they are, you know, more so publicly accountable. So um, some regulatory bodies. Um, but so I just want to make sure that I'm not just saying, you know, if you're public, you're IFRS, if you're private, you're ASPE. Um, and then if you are private and you are not um, widely accountable, you um, can choose, you can report under ASPE. Or you can choose to report under IFRS. Why might you want to report under IFRS? Well, perhaps you're planning on going public. So you're like, okay, I might as well, you know, get my IFRS statements compliant, um, get my team in place. Guys, it takes a lot of work um, and a big accounting team to get your financial statements uh, IFRS compliant. Um, you might, here's a crazy one. Um, I audited a billionaire in Calgary and when it was the transition between ASPE and IFRS and this billionaire, uh, received annual audits and he was, um, you know, considering transitioning to IFRS partly because he just really liked accounting standards and because he really liked, you know, having financial statements that were comparable and he, because why? Cause it's, he's a user, he's a user of the financial statements and he wants to know what, like, what does he have? You know, what's the economic reality of all of my investments? So, you know, it really comes back to the whole purpose of financial statements is to capture the story of the business and communicate it to the readers of the financial statements, you know, the users of the financial statements. So they have data and they have information so that they can make decisions based on that information. Concise differences between ASPE and IFRS. Does it exist? I mean, yes and no. So here's kind of the, the funny part there. In CPA, uh, you'll get access to CPA learning ebook. Some chapters um, where there's a ton of IFRS and ASPE differences will list out the differences at the back. Or for most chapters, they're like, okay, this is IFRS. And then at the end, say, okay, these are the differences between IFRS and ASPE. Um, when I first started teaching this course, I did something very similar. Um, and then about halfway through my first time teaching it, I asked students what they thought was easier, IFRS or ASPE. And everybody thought IFRS was easier, despite the accounting being kind of tricky, you know, effective interest rate versus the choice of effective interest rate and um, straight line amortization. Um, the fact that IFRS has the revaluation model and ASPE does not, like, <sighs> IFRS is tricky. You know, um, we're going to see some fun stuff in leases. Like it just, so anyways, um, so I really started asking them why. And they said, well, you know, I think it's because we just look at IFRS a lot. And then we talked about the differences in ASPE and we don't get to practice a lot. And part of me was like, well, yeah, that's because ASPE can either do like, typically, not always, they can do the complicated IFRS stuff or they can do like this really simple thing. So if you learn the hard thing, then the simple thing is simple. But it turns out that when I called it one thing or another, students tended to think that the one that we spent more time on and the one that they studied more was easier. So now we talk about this is accounting. This is how to account for it. Um, and then where appropriate, I'll talk about the major, major differences when it's something that like as an undergrad and um, 
and as appropriate in our textbook that you need to know. But I won't always, you know, be super um, separated for that very rationale. So when I ask you CPA way items for you to advise, yeah, I'm sure that you would like to go um, to a book or to a textbook and find kind of all the differences. Here's another reason. Um, if you were to ask that question at CPA, they would say, absolutely, there's a listing with all the differences. Um, one is called um, the Accounting Standards for Private Enterprises, ASPE, and the other one's called International Financial Reporting Standards, I for us. You can go and read the full standards in there and um, and see them there. And I know that's a little bit of a jerk answer, but it's, it's a little bit true in the sense that these things are just complicated. So what I'm going to do is link below because some of the firms have posted some really good like one pagers or sometimes 10 pagers um, listing out kind of a more plain English and where they will focus on some of the key differences between the two standards. Um, will it be a factor in term tests? Um, so, and I wanted to make a note to talk about the course rationale, which I just did. So, um, where it is specifically identified and specifically, um, when you are looking at the practice problems, um, yeah, it's fair game, but it has to be, um, it has to be a little, it has to be more communicated to you than just, um, in a CPA way question. That's essentially like, go do your own research. That's not fair game. Um, but as far as, you know, if we've talked about a difference, um, you know, I'm thinking, what's one? Um, just like a small one I've talked about in a few different slides, a few different places where I'm talking about um, under ASPE, we refer to the, um, the ARO kind of financing charge as accretion under ASPE and under IFRS as finance and um, the different rationales there. So we've spent a decent amount of time as well. Um, you know, things like there's OCI under uh, IFRS, but not under ASPE. Absolutely. Like that is, that is absolutely, um, examinable because it's like a whole big account, a whole big bucket that just, it isn't there. Um, so that leads us into our next question. Why no statement of changes of equity for ASPE? Well, the simple answer is because the standard doesn't require it. The longer, more robust, you know, like, well, why? Because the economic reality is it's just less complex. So if you think about it, under IFRS, you would have other people's money. So you'd have, um, you'd have your share capital and you'd have your contributed surplus. And then you'd have our internally generated company money. And you have your OCI and you have your retained earnings. Within the OCI, you will have things like... Um, Oh gosh, some FX, um, some FX fluctuations, um, revaluation model fluctuations. Um, oh gosh, some pension revaluations. Like there's all these things. So within the OCI, you need to list out each one of those as well. So the complexity of IFRS financial statements and the possible complexity, the likely complexity of those, lends to the fact that you need the statement of changes of equity for IFRS. But for ASPE, you know, you have fewer buckets less complexity, um, less formal reporting requirements. Thank you. Um, absolutely so nice to see. We had such a good turnout. Like, thank you for TT number one. Um, <laughs> uh, so many nice hellos in your debrief videos. I am absolutely loving it. Um, so many of you like will sign, sign on and say, hey, Sam. And so many of you have pointed out cool things in your room, like some blue lights. I'm really liking that. I met Maisie, um, a very cute, cuddly kitty cat, uh, like a 16-year-old kitty cat. It's so cute. What a cuddle puddle. Um, I loved, there was some plans, really plants uh, in the video. So we have some green thumbs here. Uh, overall, just so nice to see you guys. Um, I miss you, but like in a good way. Um, and I'm really glad that we had our time and cost, most of us. And I'm really glad to continuing to getting to know you in our bi-weekly huddles, in our review classes, just even, you know, receiving your videos, your Calendly office hours. And I wish you all the, all the best of empowered goodness on Thursday on your TT number one. Thank you and have a good night.